I want to thank you all for coming, and um, I want to introduce the uh, semi-annual Jeff Kipnis Lecture at the school here. Um, Jeff always requires me to come out to introduce him, because uh, he uh, <laughs> d doesn't uh, feel shy about talking at his home ground. And so I'm out as the kind of uh, uh, Charlie McCarthy, you probably don't know who that is, uh, or Mortimer Snurd for Edgar Bergen here. Um, uh, honestly, I'm here to see a football game. Um, Jeff said to me when I, on the way in that uh, he, he said, uh, you ain't interested in music, you just go to concerts. Well, I said to Jeff, you ain't interested in sport, you just go to the games. And uh, that's very true. He doesn't give a damn about athletics, but I give passionate damn. This is, this is my third football game this week, all right? Now, I defy very many people to have done that, all right? Uh, so, oh, there she is, back there, there's one. Yeah, my, my, my wife, Cynthia Davidson, has done that. Hey, Cynthia, come up here and join us. So, uh, uh, when you can find another architect or anybody on this campus who's gone to three football games this week, you let me know, other than my wife. Uh, so, I will uh, turn the program over to our speaker tonight. And uh, I'm also very happy to have uh, John McMurrah to sort of be the witness to, to this event. He's one of the great mistakes that we made at Yale. Uh, not keeping him here, uh, keeping him there. And uh, I also do want to thank you because when I was in school on the Friday night of a football game, you couldn't have gotten me to hear Frank Lloyd Wright. Last night I was in another school giving a lecture, and the name of the lecture was, uh, I know. <laughs> I was thinking to myself. I was talking to myself. He's giving a lecture tonight. No, I, you know, the, so the idea, the question in the lecture was why bother, and uh, it, it had two re it had two meanings. Um, one was why bother to study architecture like we've been teaching it for the last thirty years, given the world situation. I mean, it seems unlikely that uh, the kind of wealth and resources that we had that were used to develop the kinds of successes that we've seen in architecture over the last 30 years are going to continue. In fact, they're not going to continue. Certainly, um, the kind of building that we've seen is not going to continue. Um, if you read the Wall Street Journal yesterday, I don't know if you saw it, it said, world tries to prop up dollar. And you know, when you hear the word world or people of earth, I also heard BBC said the people of earth contributed $7 trillion to the recovery. And when you hear words like people of earth and world, it means some alien is coming down like, you know, people of earth, forget it. You know, so I, I thought it was important to, to discuss why one would consider what, what changes, if any, one would consider in education. How do I get, where do I find the computer on here? Computer, computer, where? This is it? Yes. Okay. But the other one was uh, why continue to make forms or make architecture that seems to bother people? I mean, it seems like in an age in which resources are scarce, concerns for the environment are high, um, really the idea that one would engage in a sort of uh, um, an obscure, if not self indulgent, enterprise, like making difficult form or counterintuitive architecture seemed that it needed to be reconsidered for justification. So that, that was basically the idea of the talk. Um, I started the talk by, you know, basically I gave an, I give a, I will give an argument or let an argument unfold that I believe that the education that, that the speculative architecture program produces is actually perfect for this economy since it's client oriented instead of employee oriented. And the idea that an architect will be able to expect a job in the future is probably not true. Uh, the idea that you can develop skills and, and techniques and master technologies that will allow you to engage in entrepreneurial and client relationship, I think, is very good. 
And so the only thing you have to be able to do is, uh, or be willing to do, I think, is move. For example, the four countries that were bailing out the United States, according to the Wall Street Journal, are Philippines, Korea, Thailand, and uh, I don't know, something. China, was it? But China wasn't as weird to me as the, like, being bailed out by the Philippines or by <laughs> Thailand because, you know, because they need us to not die. Anyway, so I started to, you know, it's pretty easy. They're, they, they, they've got all these dollars. The dollars are now worthless. And so they keep trying to pretend like the dollars are going to be worth it. Anyway, so all I, my, go, my goal was to say, don't worry. What is all this crap? All right, so here we are. So the other half was uh, why bother? And why bother people? Why do an architecture that bothers anybody? I, I can't see anything. OK. There you go. And, uh, you know, Peter, Peter's work is uh, sort of well known for bothering people, and he advocates a kind of intellectual difficulty. And so I thought, just for the fun of it, I was going to start the talk by showing three projects that I know bother Peter. And, <laughs> and they bother Peter, and I think they have form, strong uh, research and uh, I think they have strong roles in contemporary ar architecture of form and its counterintuitive possibilities. Uh, the first is this one. It's Villa Rotunda. Uh, Villa, Villa Rotunda is, I think, from, in my opinion, the most interesting theoretical project by um, Palladio and Scamozzi, precisely because, uh, well, the second one is Will Alsop's School of Architecture. And the third one is, uh, Greg Lynn's um, Rape of the Sabine Ducks, uh, or the Duck Table. And I know, because we've talked about these three projects, that these are three projects that, he, that constantly make him uncomfortable when one discusses them. He prefers, uh, to, to Villa Rotunda, he prefers virtually every other Palladian villa, but I think his favorite is uh, Villa Cacciatore. Is that the one? I thought our conversations were private. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. Long, long ago, I, I gave up on that idea. And then my, my hidden agenda, however, is... Villa is, Cacciatore. Yeah, Villa... That's the, that's the church you were standing in front of uh, when you said, where is the church? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Colin Rowe sent, takes him in hand as a student to Venice and teaches him personally, one-on-one, -on -one, the great achievements of Palladian architecture. I'm going to Venice, and Peter gives me a list. Go see these buildings. You're going to love them. <laughs> I come up to this building. It's like here. It's Red and Tory by Palladio. And I'm looking, I think, what's this old church? There's nothing so great about this. This can't be it. So the guy's sitting right there, and I said, uh, where's Red and Tory? And he says, he goes like this, right here. So then I went back and I read the book by Colin Rowe and Vitkover, and then I finally got it. So this, on the other hand, is, I mean, they read the book by Vitkover. Uh, this painting by David Sally, I think, is the reason that I'm interested in the three projects I just showed you. If you just, if, it's not really a diptych. I don't know if you can see it very well. Am I wired up? Uh, you know, there's a painting of a woman in distress, naked woman, hair over it in the background. But on top of this is a kind of frivolous cartoon figure. Uh, I think the painting in the background would be a, a fabulous painting in its own right. I think it would be, it is a beautiful painting. But what happens when the two come together are really extremely interesting, intellectually interesting, disturbing, but I, and in particular because they're not a collage, I don't think. I think they are a simultaneous and incongruent layering of two ontologies and that they produce a kind of world possibility of a world condition that I think is very interesting to study. And if architecture could do that, it could break out of some of its stranglehold in how to address what it means by realism or what it means by critical practices. So the hidden agenda of the talk is this painting. Uh, you know, Peter, there's two kinds of ways Peter likes to bother people. This is the more famous way, and that is stick stuff where it doesn't belong. Uh, so you come in, you're going down a staircase, you're on the cell phone, and bang. And then you think, OK, that hurt, but maybe you had to hold the building up. And then you look at the other column, and you find out the damn columns don't even hold the building up. 
You know, so that's the sort of more famous way Peter bothers people. But the more disciplinary way uh, is to produce these kinds of drawings. And this is a sort of level of intellection and erudition and treatment of form in, that's absolutely obscure. Uh, it's, a, it's an idea about form, but it's not an idea about form like cubes or pyramids or ideal gardens. It's an idea about formal processes that leave indexical residues, and it becomes the point of the work. So the idea that you would ever build a building, that the experience of the building itself, or even the understanding of the building uh, in terms of its site or its program uh, or its institutional status or the, its, the histories that are involved, um, he erases, and instead he puts these processes in the foreground and for a long time, I thought it meant you act to, to understand the architecture, you actually had to understand these drawings. Uh, and basically for 10 or 15 years when I worked with Peter, that was the, the issue, was not only did you work through the processes and develop a certain rigor on them, you expected the, your colleagues in the field and any audience for the work to also learn this work. Um, Later on, I began to realize there was a shift in the discourse from meaning and semiotics to a question of effects. Uh, I was part of that shift. And so instead of asking myself, what does that building mean or what do those processes mean, I started to ask what effects they produced. Uh, and that way I could distinguish between the possible audiences for the buildings. You know, any, uh, the effect of a building will be different on an, uh, someone with a strong interest or a professional and someone that constituency. And I started to realize that this blackboard became my symbol for the kinds of effect Peter Eisman works. This is the blackboard, which uh, the famous shot of the blackboard of the derivation by Albert Einstein of the general theory of relativity. And what's really incredible about the blackboard is um, you don't have to know what it means. In fact, it's particularly interesting and as an icon precisely because you don't know what it means but you are guaranteed by the erudition of its process that it means something to a very few people that's too obscure for you to know. And so it creates a kind of obscurantism as effect, which would give, and I think in a very interesting way, architecture a way of, a, a, a way of being an intellectual um, enterprise that it never had before. But it started to occur to me that this was the more important effect. This is the effect of Peter Eisman. I think this is the effect of Peter Eisman wherever he works in the world. The fact that a few of us know what the, the, the details of that process is like the few people in physics that know the general theory of relativity. Uh, but at, as a cultural enterprise, none of us have to know that. And all we have to know is that there's a guarantee of it. The reason I think Peter doesn't like this uh, building is because this plan is formally inert. It actually does not give itself to any analysis in the way that he likes to analyze a diagrammatic formalism project. It's, compared to all the other projects, it has very little interest to, not in terms of form, but in terms of formal analysis. Um, on the other hand, as far as I'm concerned, it's the first conceptual work in architecture. Uh, conceptual in the sense that there's nothing about the experience that could explain to you why you would build a building with four front doors. You build a building with four front doors. I'm sure Doug is here, and if Doug is here, he can, I hope he's not here, because he will definitely not. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, not, Doug is not with us tonight, so he can't really explain why there, <laughs> why there are four front doors. And since I don't know why there are four front doors, I feel very comfortable to declare that there shouldn't be four front doors. So it seems kind of weird that you would walk into a building and to be like the twilight zone, and just when you're about to walk out, oh, you're back at the front door again. And you say, oh, I must have taken a wrong turn. And you go in, you turn the other way, and you're, oh, I'm at the front door again. You're just stuck in this building forever. But the plan itself is such a strong icon that for me, the building is interesting as a conceptual work of architecture because it's a building about a drawing. And I think Peter Eisenman is also does buildings about drawings. Finally, or maybe not finally, this building seems to bother Peter enormously. This is Will Alsop's. Um, School of Architecture. Now, Peter likes to know that there's a strong sense of disciplinarity in the work. In other words, that the, the work comes out of not some sui generis sense of invention or design or composition. There has to be a strong sense of understanding of anteriority in the work, interiority. One works by building on the work of other people. So I'm looking at this building and I think, well, this is very easy to see how this work developed. He starts with Le Corbusier. It's basically a floating Corbusian prism on piloti. 
he then looks at, uh, he's from London and went to the AA, so he becomes interested in, in the recollection of the walking city and archigram, and he sees the possibility of bringing these to bear on each other. He then throws in a dash of strange columns that he gets from Villa de Lava by Ram Coolhouse. And just for a little bit of wit, oh, he then looks at uh, um, Le Frenois by, Le, by, by, who's by uh, Chumi, which basically is a way of building on top of existing buildings as kind of creating a new sort of interstitiality. He then throws in a little humor, I think, you know, uh, to try to figure out how uh, to get the staircase in, and then you get the building. And so it's virtually, virtually impossible not to understand this building in any other way except in its disciplinary terms. It seems, and so it seems to me that this should be something Peter would be very interested in, uh, but he's not very interested in it at all. And I was reminded by, about the way that the abstract expressionists first reacted to the pop artists because they just thought the work was too frivolous and too uh, not serious. And it had nothing to do with the intellectual qualities of the work. For example, Andy Warhol's um, uh, portraits and Andy Warhol's soup cans essentially reanimated the genre problem in, archi I mean, in painting. It became, you could go, go back to still lifes, which had gotten erased in the debate between figuration and abstraction. So it was really a crucial moment, and I think this building actually belongs to that same kind of thing, and I, and, but Peter will not give it the time of day. Finally is uh, the duct tables by Greg Lynn. Um, basically, it draws very heavily on the Baroque um, sculptural tradition. Uh, it's, it, it might as well have been derived from an analysis of John Bologna's Rape of the Sabine Women. Uh, it's also particularly interesting because it solves a conceptual problem for Greg, and that was Greg wanted to make multiplicities of form that didn't refer, refer to an ideality, um, and then that's why we had the embryological house, but you can't just keep making a thousand pseudo projects and then one building. It's different to make one building and a, and a set of drawings. It's another one to say that there has to be a thousand buildings in order for the conceptual project to work. And so Greg turns instead to found work, uh, toys in this case. He, it reminds, uh, try to remember the cartoon figure in the David Sally painting, and then he basically works through the technology and the techniques of, of combining those, and so he gets, he solves the problem of needing to do a one of a kind, but at the same, at the same time that uses the conceptual apparatus of relationship to multiplicity. Um, I, I'm very flattered that Jeff would take all this time to explain to you what bothers me. Uh, it would seem the subtext is, why should what bothers me bother him? Uh, in other words, things that bother you according to psychoanalysis are the things you want to talk about when you're with your shrink or when you're with your students or in group therapy like this, etc. cetera. So uh, the, the real question that underlies it, why should what I get bothered by bother him? Uh, why not just let it be? Um, I would argue, and, and I think the issue of bother is a, a red herring in this discussion because he shows a David Sally painting and then uh, wouldn't most people be bothered by that painting? You betcha. The people that would be bothered by an architecture by me or whomever else he would cite would certainly be bothered by the painting. Uh, and I would want to argue that literature, music, uh, any of the other disciplines, art, uh, it always bothers people. So therefore, I mean, so what's new? Anything that didn't bother anybody is not worthwhile. I mean, you know, Coca-Cola bothers nobody. Uh, a great wine bothers a lot of people. Uh, they have, you know, different tastes. So uh, I would assume that the issue is, a, is really a non-issue. Uh, sure, I get bothered by things. You know, I hate Yankee fans. Uh, I, I hate the Yankees. I, it bothers me, uh, you know. It would, but it doesn't bother me that he likes the Yankees, you know. He likes winners, uh, and he's always jumping around to winners. So, you know, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a Red Sox fan, so, and I have been a Red Sox fan since 1942 or 43. Uh, as long as I can remember. And uh, 
but I'm also beginning to hate Red Sox fans when they start winning and they get arrogant like the Giant fan. I mean, like the Yankee fans. Anyway, uh, but um, so wait a minute, may I finish? I have a few points that I, I like to finish. Um, the second thing is uh, I wanted to talk about Cacciatore, uh, Palazzo Cacciatore that Jeff talked about. Um, I can't tell if he was referring to Palazzo Carcieri, Palazzo Cacciari, Palazzo Caracci, or Palazzo Chiaracati, because they're all versions of, uh, of Palazzo Cacciatore. Um, so uh, one never knows with Jeff because of his uh, scholarship that does bother some scholars. It doesn't bother me, but etc. Are those really four different villas? They are four different villas. Yeah, they are. Um, I mean, it's the same thing. I happen to like Wagner. Jeff likes Verdi, let's say. Those are different tastes in, in, in operatic music. Um, it shouldn't bother one that one likes Wagner. There's a different kind of complexity in Wagner and a different kind of affect in Wagner than there is in Verdi. Um, that's a simple thing. Uh, Jeff has not put on the table what is really the serious uh, conceptual issue that underlies the bother. And I, I'd like to try and, and, and put that out for us perhaps to talk about. I'm interested in a word uh, called project. And I believe that the great architects in history have had what I call a project. That is a conceptual underpinning uh, or theoretical underpinning to their work, whether that theoretical underpinning deals with grammar, whether it deals with rhetoric or effect that uh, Jeff was talking about. All arguments have grammar and they all have rhetoric uh, and they have it in various uh, constellations. So I'm interested in project. I'm interested in coming to this school because I believe that many of the teachers here are interested in project uh, and in fact have a project in one form or another. I think there are two types of project. Uh, one uh, basically is considered in terms of design or construction, that is a concern with the style, with the look of something, how it's put together, etc. And the other is concerned with its theoretical and, and conceptual basis. Uh, I think that uh, those are two different kinds of tastes. Jeff, I really think, is much more concerned with design and construction. He theorizes it. Uh, for example, someone like Peter Zumthor. Uh, Peter Zumthor is interested in how things go together. He has a project, but it's a project of construction. Uh, he theorizes how things go together. Uh, Will Alsop is interested in design. Uh, his project is design, and he theorizes design. I'm not interested in theorizing design or interested in theorizing construction because I, in my uh, concerns, uh, they uh, act or activate less uh, than the conceptual and theoretical concerns. I think that design and construction bothers people less. Uh, I think most buildings on this campus are well-designed, well-construction, bother nobody. Uh, in fact, uh, there, there wouldn't be as many buildings like there are on this campus uh, if they, in fact, bothered people. So, and all across the world, the, the people who are interested in design and construction produce work that is less bothersome than others. Uh, and I think that 90% of the people in this room will end up uh, being very successful at design and construction, uh, having that as a project, but bothering no one. I believe the real, uh, for me, and I, I use real, uh, the, 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 the interesting project is the project of, of theory and, and conceptualization that is built. There are very few architects that I believe in the world today uh, uh, are dealing with those things. Rem Koolhaas is one, uh, Bob Venturi is another, Rafael Moneo is another. 
I can think of maybe on the fingers of, uh, of two hands the number of architects who I think have or teach a project. I think Greg Lynn has a project. Zaira Polo has a project. I mean, one can elaborate. It's not just one generation. Uh, a project in the conceptual and theoretical sense as well as built. That is the important aspect of project. And so Jeff and I choose to disagree uh, about, I don't care if, if the whole world is bothered by my work. I imagine 99% of the world is bothered by James Joyce, uh, Finnegan's Wake. Uh, James Joyce didn't care. He wasn't writing his literature so that people would be happy with it. The people who designed these, this building, I don't think designed this building so that people would be happy here. Uh, I, don't think ar <laughs> I don't think architecture is about making people happy. Uh, I don't think art is. Uh, and the, the real question is why it should be of a concern to us tonight. And that because Jeff is trying to separate architecture from art, literature, music. That those things, it doesn't matter if they bother people, but it does matter if architecture bothers people. Uh, and I don't believe that's the case. I believe that architecture is part of that culture uh, that has always bothered people. Uh, and I've said on, a, on many occasions, when they start locking architects up in jail because they really bother people, like philosophers, poets, uh, painters like Mapplethorpe, etc then it would be time to get concerned. But nobody cares about architecture enough to lock any architect up that's bothersome. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, your argument, uh, while you would like to provoke one uh, through that, I think is not, is not one that wants to be on the table because uh, bothersome is probably what art is in, in your terms. Do you want to respond? I, I feel uh, tangential to the conversation no, no, this far. Not. No, no, you're not. I will respond. Don't worry. <laughs> no, no, you respond first. Uh, well, I mean, I think just one thing in terms of parsing the issues at this point, the, the question of the, the bothersome versus the disciplinarity uh, in your work, Peter, and also in the way that it's hinted at in, in Jeff's uh, preamble. So I was taken with the reading of the um, theory of relativity as a formula and as a sort of working through of the formula. You, you called it the sort of affect of difficulty and the sort of impenetrability of it uh, and the sort of trust and expertise that's then aligned uh, through that. And I'm struck with, one, the bothersome as, a, as an objective that locates itself in the perceiving subject. So I would say that as an extra disciplinary audience that works through the affect of difficulty versus the, whether you call it techniques or procedures or the theoretical project within architecture, which has its own meaning that I think operates outside of the, the, the ambition of difficulty. I mean, so trying to parse out if we're going to create a sort of, um, you know, if all art is difficult and the, and the work uh, tries to achieve that ends, then what is the place in the construction of that dis difficulty, one from a standpoint of expertise, which would seem to be not merely creating difficulty because difficulty is easy to achieve, perhaps, because then it would just be incomprehensibility creates difficulty, versus the, the questions of the audience. And so this is where I think in, in your presentation, it's quite interesting that yes, all of them achieve difficulty, and I, and I see in your discussion a trying to map through under other criteria by which a kind of disciplinary conversation would take place, but like, I don't know, I'm, I'm just curious in the difference between the outside of the field, the perceiving subject and, and their effects versus the internal discourse and how difficulty maps in between the two. Because I think they're slightly different concerns that overlap in the school. You said art is, I don't think, art is difficult per se. It's, it's, not, it's not a category it, it, art is, sure. right? and it happens to be difficult to 90% of the people, and why shouldn't it be? Sure. I mean, uh, and, and but I, I guess, I guess but that helps me to articulate the, the construction of 
difficulty per se as an objective would have one set of criteria, so setting up situations that have their primary ambition as creating anxiety in the subject versus uh, a sort of residual effect of a pursuit within a disciplinary framework, whether it's painting or sculpture or architecture, that has a sort of side difficult. effect. They well, are. this is what this is what I'm trying to, to parse out. Do. But this is the artists don't set out to be difficult. They are sure they're difficult people. Look at us. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, I mean, you know, that's why we're in Columbus as opposed to other places because we're too difficult. Uh, <laughs> you know. Uh, what? I'm here. <laughs> I'm here. Right? Yale is not a place of great difficulty. Yeah, I see. <laughs> uh, no, go ahead. You're formally difficult. Um, no, I, part of the agenda is Bob mapped out an argument about difficult and easy. And what he wanted to do was to say that those were intrinsic properties of certain formal types, shape versus form. Uh, so he tried to make an argument about intrinsic difficulty and intrinsic easiness. I realize that the, that the for, I'm a cultural critic. For example, I do have a theory, or I do believe in the autonomy of disciplines, but I don't work within the autonomy of disciplines. I'm interested in the effect of architecture outside, because of its dif disciplinary procedures, but outside of those. So Peter Eisenman's discussion with me about Peter Eisenman's work is interesting, but irrelevant in the sense of a cultural argument. I'm particularly interested in, so for example, for Peter's formalisms or his procedures, for me, are liberating or, or make an argument of liberation in the sense that they require people to pay attention to the building. Uh, and, there, and to pay close attention to the building at the very moment that the a building would normally recede into inattention so that they could exercise power over, you know, to go to the Wexner Center or to go to any museum, the museum starts to tell you the work is good as soon as you quit paying attention to it. You know, so as long as the, the, the building is demanding that you pay attention to it, it's also requiring that you think about the roles it has in constructions of subjects and in relationships to power. Um, so I started to think, you know, if you look at a, if you look at a green dot, uh, it's, it's easy. If it's a bullet, if, it, if it's a graphic bullet in a paragraph, its effects are difficult. And so there, my argument is going to be that there's no intrinsic quality of easiness or difficulty to a form. What you have to do is to look at the degree to which it's substantially per perturbing uh, ex the existential fabric and the political fabric of the moment. You know, so that, right, that's right, and that's why, well, it's not a zeitgeist argument, it's a, let's put it this way, it's a complexity theory argument about the collaboration of, of many different forces that construct. You know, so, I, that's why I don't care what people think about Will Alsop as, on the audience, but in the field, it has, the, it has it, it's a very perturbing building in the field. Um, and it's a perturbing building in the field to, Peter and others, but but you you it. I know that's exactly what I'm saying. I don't think about that. That's exactly you know, and what's your argument? This autobiographical argument is that you know Will Alsop. Will Alsop's an idiot, and therefore you don't have to, you're not required to think about his work. It's about is about as is about as that's exactly what you just got through saying. Will Alsop is a designer. He thinks about design. He does. His theory is a theory of design. And what you're basically saying is Will Alpsop is an exterior decorator. You know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying is here's a building that meets every bit of criteria that you would want for a disciplinary building and also is perturbing the discipline. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. It's perturbing the discipline precisely because it doesn't seem difficult. Can I, Jeff, you have, look, everybody has to know that Jeff has an investment in this argument, right? So let's get the subtext, right? This is a, no, no, I mean, no. I mean, the father's not interested in being killed, uh, by the way, that's my subtext. You have an interest in killing the father. I, I, I thought that had been done. <laughs> no, see, that's a, that's a problem, I'm still alive. I'd say you're fully, you don't make the, the discipline uneasy anymore. According, you have an investment in thinking that. But do you think Godard continues to make the, the film world? The who? 
Godar. Oh, yeah, I did. Uh, do you, you know, so you basically think, I mean, I, I don't think abstract expressionism or gestural work, I mean, the whole history of the mark. I believe the work that I'm working on now, that's being constructed now, is the most uneasy making of all the works I've done. I think in terms of your late style argument, yeah. you're correct. Thank but that's got to do with your particular body of work as opposed to the cultural status of the work. Well, For example, Be by the time Beethoven was writing his late style, all uh, other, uh, Peter has this argument about, that, it, that derives from a book by Edward Said about um, essentially the late work of Beethoven being such a deep exploration of the formal and combinatorial arguments of music that, he, that it, was, it had become detached from all arguments of effect. But, but, but what Beethoven realized, like any human being who uh, is getting older, that it's impossible at my age uh, to be an enfant terrible. It, it doesn't wear well. Uh, you've often said that, that you have to assume your place in life, in, in the role that you play, right? So the work, the idea of late work is the recognition that one is in a late stage of one's being, and therefore, there are several options that you have not to be avant-garde, right? And so one wouldn't expect Peter Eisenman or Rafa Moneo or whomever that's uh, over 70 or 75 to be avant-garde. It's just, you know, and to try and stay avant-garde is a foolish preoccupation. But Peter, you think that serious conceptual architecture has a look? No, no, I don't. No, no, it changes. No. Changes all the time. I basically have tried to show you three projects yeah. that I think meet the standard of serious conceptual architecture as it's evolved yeah. through the day. And I, I don't agree with you. I know. And that's, you know so but that doesn't mean that either you're right or wrong and I'm right or wrong just because you no, are labeled. Right or wrong, it's about, it, once you decide that conceptual work is a style, which is no. what you argue. No, I don't. You Look, as a, cultural, project, as a you cultural critic, no, as a cultural critic, I think you can't see. That's your problem. <laughs> that's, that's it in a nutshell. You're a fabulous mind. By the way, we'll put you in front of work. I agreeing with you. I can't see what you can see, and you can see when something theoretical, and you can see when it's not. Right. And I, I just got through saying, you think what being theoretical is is a style. No. You can see it. I can, I don't call, it's just because you can see being a style. I mean, art, when I look at, at, at David Sally, there's good Sally, bad Sally, Sally that has issues that are interesting, but you first have to be able to see to understand that. It's not a style. It, that painting is not necessarily a style of... Yeah, but like if I show you something like Murakami, if I show you some of the super flat work, yeah. you were going to say it's just too decorative and too... It's, I, it's trite. You, I can say that. Now, there is a argument that, that, that why wouldn't it be possible for the using the yeah. trite to be a theoretical... Let, let's, 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 let's work this through this way. You believe in expertise, and I believe the same thing. In other words, when I go to a concert, Cynthia will say, that guy's flat, right? I can't hear flat. I wouldn't know flat if it fell on me, right? Um, I, I'm tone deaf. Right? So going to music for me has no benefit in terms of, I can't hear, okay? When Michael Haneke, who's one of my favorite filmmakers, says my, my films are oral rather than visual, right? I understand what he means, right? And I can understand orality in terms of his filmmaking because it doesn't have anything to do with flat. In other words... O-R-A-L. No, A-U-R-A-L, oral, all right? Yeah, you know, I know. And they also vary O R. Like I see. most of the filmic effects occur because of the disjunction right. between the sound, sound of, and the well. That's oral, I would think. A U R A L. Okay. Uh, so uh, the 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 point I'm trying to make is 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 that when I say you can't see, uh, you don't have the expertise to judge what I think is seeing. All right. And uh, that's because you haven't been trained to see. You've been trained to see painting and uh, trained to hear music 
and you hear it very well, and you're trained to understand scientific exploration that's, that is projectual, et cetera. But um, I, I would argue that there's an enormous difference between Bob Somel's idea of projective and the idea of project that I'm talking about. And it has something to do with how architects are trained. In other words, uh, it's nothing to do with stylistics. It's to do with the fact that the reason why Nikolai Orosov or Paul Goldberg or any of those people who write public criticism are miss the work is because they can't see. They weren't trained to see as architects. Not that they can't see, but they don't know how to see as well, architects. It kind of sounds like this, Peter. And that's an expertise. How do you know when someone can't see? That's an expertise. No, that's an expertise. No, no. I guess I'm about to ask you some questions about seeing. All right. Okay. Uh, why can't you see the little rotunda? I can. I think it's fabulous. No, you don't. You, how do you know that? I don't tell you the truth. I ask you. I don't tell you the truth. Okay, what's fabulous about it? Well, I'm not here to discuss that, but I, I have a book. I have a book that I've written on Palladio. I know, and you have to write about it because it's the last word. No, no, no. It's an amazing work. But what's amazing about it? Oh, yeah. Uh, I said, I, you know. Just give us a little, help us see it. Well, first of all, it's not static, and it's not symmetrical. There is a layering in it that is very interesting, which you miss because you can't see the plan. I can see. I. I. I there's a front and a back. There is, is a front and a back. Thank there's you. A, there's a slide. Okay, so they're not there's four a, entries. And and uh, Doug Graff, who is. Uh, I mean, one I of, can draw you the. I can draw you the slight elongations that produce no, the front no, and no, the we, back as good as anybody else. I'm glad but you the can. The fact of the matter but is. But you can't draw Palazzo uh, Cacciatore. Right. But the fact of the matter is the effect of the building. Is not about the like. For example, your it analysis. Is. Hang on a second. It is your analysis. The of, center is not a center. I know that, but let me ask you about this. Your analysis. Well, you of asked Gary. me to give you something. Okay. That was. Well, we're talking about seeing. You go to Cleveland, and you see Weatherhead, and what you basically see is a version of Semper's Altus Museum. No, I, I Schinkel's. Schinkel's, I'm sorry. Thing. So it doesn't matter. It's so all the S is the same. Yeah, Schinkel, what difference? Yeah. What know, do I care? Wikipedia. It's, it's long, long ago. That's yeah. right. Long, long ago. Yeah, so you go up there and you see this work, which is doing an incredible amount of formal operations, but virtually none of it interesting in the plan. And all you can see is. And section. It's interesting in section. Yeah, in section. I right talk there. about the section in my yeah, book. I read the book. You know? well, I, don't, well, I don't know if you read the book. <laughs> but, it's, you know, so you would like it to submit to which you believe to be the canons to which you will measure the deviations from. No, yeah. I didn't say it should submit. I said it opens up those canons to question. I know, but you never actually ask what the effects are and why. The effects to me, you, you, you think of effects as different than I do. I think of effects in, in Paul DeMond's terms of rhetoric, all right? Uh, and, and I use that uh, and you use the word effect, right? I've always used, whether it's syntax and semantics, I've always I relied know. on yeah. a linguistic right. framework yeah. to, to judge these things, all right? So, we're, we're, you know, we're apples and oranges. It's no, okay. we're not. We're not apples and oranges. No, we we're green apples and red apples. <laughs> uh, no, um, red and blue apples. You, you want to say something? Yeah, I'm, Go ahead. I'm curious in relation to this, this discussion, uh, one of your recent books, Peter, when you talk about the ten canonical buildings, yeah. which I think was a really fantastic book. And Not the ten canonical buildings. Ten, my, my bad. Ten, it's open-ended. My ten. But um, no, I said ten. Ten of a, of a possibly larger set. Yeah. But in that discussion, and especially in introduction, there's a way in which this issue of whether you call it recognizing the conceptual or reading a certain sort of intellection within the work. Well, I say they're cusp buildings. That's the they're real, cusp buildings, but I'm Harold Bloom's yep. uh, discussion of canonical works of literature. Sure. So let's get it clear sure. that what I'm saying is that one view of canonical is cusp. Okay. You mean at the point of the swerve? Yeah. Okay. At the point. I guess I'm just curious about the, the last cusp of, of that work, because right. as you go through the readings of those projects, which mostly occur within the 20th century, the well, final cusp... Wait a minute, my dear friend. They are from 1950 to 2000. That, that was okay. The, that, even even that better, even are. better. They, so the, <laughs> by, the end, by the end, the ability to read in your own readings of the projects, you talk about a certain way that there's issues in the work that seems to be taking place that right. become 
uh, relatively, I would say, unmappable given right. the, the tendencies of the work. So I'm most curious, on the one hand, when you talk about late work and your own work developing in a kind of you know, deep retrospection of the issues in your own career versus looking at outside of your work into these canonical buildings and the way you see development in the general field. And, and so I think Jeff has one version of it, and I'm curious how you would put a, a term to that. Well, first of all, I think the term late and lateness is very useful because I, I think without a paradigm shift, and if we were to mark changes in architecture, they usually begin from uh, some cultural, political, economic shift. Now, we may be witnessing a, a, a paradigm shift in the move from late capitalism to fundamentalism, let's say, and all, you know, from colonialism to uh, autonomous political entities which have nothing to do with territory and, and, and power in, in a certain way. If in fact that's the case, if that is a paradigm shift that's occurring, that's a radical shift from the late 19th and, and through the 20th century, the paradigm that occupied us called, called modernism or postmodernism, et cetera. Um, and it deals with a shift, I would argue, from, and the, and the reason why I'm, I'm look, going back to my work is that a, a, a movement uh, a rhetorical movement like um, the modernism started from the rhetoric and moved into a grammar, right? My, my students have no ability to manipulate a grammar because there's no grammar that fits the rhetoric of today. So what Paul Deman would argue is that most uh, uh, cycles of history begin from uh, grammatical changes which uh, then uh, evolve into a rhetoric which starts, in other words, the grammatical changes suggest the rhetoric of the new paradigm, uh, and then the rhetoric needs to find a new grammar because, and it's the new grammar coming out of rhetoric that is interesting to me today because uh, I believe that the old grammars, we, we can't teach Renaissance, modernism, etc. Right. So I'm interested in what are the possible r r grammars that can evolve from the rhetoric of, to uh, of today, and that's a late condition because uh, modernism is in a what I would call its Rococo, uh, late Rococo phases. You know, excesses like some of the things that Dr. Kipnis showed. Um, and I would, I would argue they are late. Uh, I would also argue that if we take the rhetorical tropes that are operative in the possible new paradigms that are working today, we need to find other grammars. Peter Eisenman is not going to find those uh, because uh, I'm late, okay? But I'm talking about the issues that are involved today in lateness and the search what I believe for students, I mean, uh, the search for possible new grammars. I don't think what Jeff showed are new grammars, I think they're late grammars. And uh, I don't think they're bad because they're late, because I'm involved in the same late grammars. But I don't think that's what these people need to be thinking about, right? Uh, I, I Basically, I would agree that we don't know a new grammar yet. But I want to talk to you about I want to go back and try this thing one more time. That was a nice concession. Well, I, well, I, That's good. Thank you. I've always thought you were occasionally right. <laughs> um, if you look at the arts in general in the modernist period, and if we, if we mean by abstraction in each field, I don't mean pictorial abstraction, but in the... Conceptualization. You know, so atonality uh, is a kind of abstraction. Non-representation non in painting is a kind of abstraction, whether it's Mondrian or Mark. Okay. Um, and then the conceptual project in, in the modernism, not, not the rhetorical project, but the conceptual project of your work. Um, those became cliches in the sense that they produced an institutionalized form of attention and, and status, and, and they, they always, always do. do. Okay. And so what's really important is to introduce the idea of cliche breaking as a necessary condition. Well, that's what lateness could be. 
I think cliche is, I think the argument that Saeed makes is that it can't be cliche breaking. It can only set it into motion. But I want to ask you. But I want to ask about the ten canonic buildings. Yes. But there is the cliche in the ten canonic as an ensemble is a form of paying attention to a building. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the cliche at a certain point, like Elliot Carter in, in music, was a, was a form of paying attention to music. And then when people like the minimalist in music started to write that, it was the idea that they were going to look at a conceptual possibility in another form of paying attention, which was not inattention, not, but neither was it close attention. And that's why the Einstein thing was, you know, you're basically saying, gosh, I should be paying really close attention to Inattention. This. And close attention are very linked because close inattention is a very interesting. Well, I'm just saying. I mean, so, so when you see the works of art and other things, I'm trying to show you. They're really, I think, their desire is to break the institutional status and the form of attention commanded by a certain right. kind of conceptual. Let's attitude. let's 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 go back to the Haneke Bresson example for me. Bresson was a filmmaker who was saying that you have to pay close attention right. to nothing happening. So was Andy Warhol. In other words, a 10-hour film. Uh, uh, yeah, what? Yeah. yeah. Uh, can you pay attention for 10 hours to nothing, right? Because that, the nothing is what you're supposed to be paying attention to. Haneke would argue that Warhol's uh, sleep and, you know, uh, uh, the whatever, Michael Snow's wavelength, uh, would be cliche today because they've been done over and over again, right? So, uh, and that Bresson, to do Bresson or Godard, as you said today, would be cliche. So he has to find a way to articulate uh, a possibility of opening up those cliches. And I think what Haneke does is to say we're no longer involved in close attention like Bresson or Michael Snow or, or Andy Warhol. Uh, but we're now interested in what he would call close inattention. That is, not really paying attention because you don't need to, but some, it's not not needing to. It's needing to need to uh, not pay attention. Well, actually, to be honest with you, I just want, I think those three things I just showed yeah, but I, I are about I close inattention. I think they're late. No, you, I think they're back. Let's I have, well, that's, hey, you know, that's what makes ball games. No, I got it. Uh, they but are I, late. But I think that what but I... But they become, they're not Rococo. That's what I mean. They're uh, not, Rococo is I a guess kind Rococo, of... I guess Rococo, I was thinking of people like Tom Main and, and Zaha Hadid who make gratuitous, you know, formal for the sake of doing it. And, and I would say Wolf Pricks. I'm going to get all your favorites in there. I, I, I would say they're, they're the Rococo You're my guys. very favorite. No, <laughs> I ain't Rococo, buddy. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't do Rococo. But no, no, I think the re all I was trying, the only objection I had to your uh, prolegomena was the question that bothersome would be what we're talking about. And I don't think we should be, I think we should talk about lateness as opposed to bothersome. Because well, I'm, I think lateness is a project of the moment. Well, I, the reason, when you, when, to be difficult is no longer bothersome. But who's talking about difficulty? We're talking about lateness. Well, I, no, but the work, all like the ten canonic buildings are. There's not a there's not a building in there that you would pay close inattention to. I mean, you pick the one building by. No, no, I agree. No, but it's it's about a. I agree. It is a late book about late work. Okay, and none of this work is in there. Nothing uh, like this work is in there. And so that's why I'm making claims about a new form of attention as being the existential. You know, it's like sati or. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, here, here's in fact, the thing. Pop art. Was Can you that. say, when you say that, I, I'm not convinced that because of the fact you can't see, uh, that you are ever going to be able to, wit you know, see those things. That, that's my my thing. You can't, you can't tell whether it is or it isn't. And I would rather take my own view of it than yours, that's all. Uh, 
I think I think we'll so I'll you, stop. Wait a minute, can at, I tell you when what? you look at the duct table, can I, can you I can't see anything in the duct no, table. No, I, I don't see anything in the duct table. But I wish ducks. I wish Greg would go back to doing architecture, but because I love Greg and I think he's one of the more interesting. Well, and the duct I think, table and the I'll house tell you are the virtually problem the same with the, thing. The house, the house and the duct table are the same damn thing. They are. And when you go see the house. Uh, Not the Bloom house, even the Slavin house. No, I'm talking about the Slavin house is a different, different, they're an entirely different thing. Slavin house is a very interesting work of architecture. The Bloom house is not. Uh, why, why don't we open it up? Yeah. Uh, since yeah, anybody have any questions? Well, maybe John does, or yeah. Rob, or well, yeah. John. Anybody? They don't, don't batter them. Into I'm not going to batter them. I, I was no, going to. should talk. How do you get them to talk? Pick out somebody that you know. Which is exactly has, what I was just about to do. Has a burning question who's intelligent enough to stand up and say something in public. Kevin. Hi. <laughs> See, all right. He wants to go hey, to Yale. No. We, listen, he is the underground railway, railway to Yale, by the way. If, if he knows you, you get into Yale, period. He gives me the list. But if you tell we, Bob you know me, you're out. <laughs> no, no, you don't tell Bob that That's at right. all. Holy shit, you don't do that. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I have a list that he gives me that I take to Bob, and those people walk in, and the, my best students at Yale, I forgot to say that, happen to be Ohio State students. They are fantastic. I Taught by a blind person. <laughs> Thought by a blind person. But there are other ways. Whoa. There's Rob Livesey. There's John. There's, come on. There's Doug. There's Ho Jose. Come on. The real seers. <laughs> sea urchin? Go ahead, Kevin. Let's hear it. Uh, I guess my question is about the slaving house. Do you want to go to Yale? Did you go there for the visiting day? No, I haven't been there. He, no, he decided to come here for graduate school, and I said, why? I yeah, asked that's why. that's dumb. You know he said, you know, I heard uh, what people were learning at Yale, and I heard what people were learning here, and it sounded like there's better future here. <laughs> <laughs> Yale's a good place. I like it. I wish they What's your question? Too. I'll repeat it for the audience, so go ahead. The, the way it, it deals with uh, reference, not, not only referencing, but performing like you mentioned before, uh, I guess, and maybe the deficiencies of the other like, the blue, right. How, how maybe that student can get an idea of architecture for project, and how that kind of lateness could possibly come in. Is there any, is there any other issues in those two? Well, Let's ask a question. Another one of his favorite people is Ben Van Berkel, who lives off of single surface projects without any, theor to me, theoretical or conceptual consequence. They're stylistic. And so they're, uh, okay. I mean, I'm just saying there's a difference. I know you can see them. I guess you just don't understand them. Ben Van Berkel, <laughs> I love Ben. He's a neat guy. Uh, I love all your buddies. They're not as funny as some of my buddies, but they're, they're, yeah. they're Boy, funny. That Rafa Maneo is a laugh riot. <laughs> he, he actually is a laugh riot. <laughs> but not on purpose. <laughs> He's very funny. <laughs> Many things, he says. He always. Is, uh, no, but I think that... Michael the, Graves a Cuban. Yeah. Remember I him? think that the Slavin House um, that is not interesting to me because it's necessarily or a single surface project, and I'm not convinced that single surface as an idea um, is just like I'm not con interested in parametric design. Uh, I'm not sure that that's the way out. And I, I, I think the fetish of singles, I think single surface work and parametric work, which was interesting in the 1990s, by the way, in terms of where we are, has become very cliche. And I think that the reason Ben Van Berkel, when he first did his first project, was really interesting. Uh, Alejandro Zayaropolo's first single surface project was very interesting. And then it, it rolls into, into, there's no question, he would realize that the late work of Ben Van Berkel and Alejandro, et cetera, as the repetition of single surface projects isn't going anywhere. 
just like the parametric work that you see from any number of people, to me, isn't going anywhere. So I'm not sure that those are the interesting directions. I would say most people that were discussing Beethoven's late work would say the same thing. It was not going anywhere. <laughs> Peter Eisman's late work is it's not. It's not that it's not deepening the project, but it is actually it's actually not, not going, going anywhere. anywhere. Going anywhere is not what the work is about. I know, and going anywhere is not what the what what Ben's work no, is. No, but he was asking about the possibility of single surface. His question was, is I, I absolutely agree but with you. I mean, how is Traveler? How is Traveler's Billy? The travel, whatever that was, travel. Long Island. That was a commercial project. That's right. But you tried it, use it as an, as an no, opportunity. Hang no. on, you use it as an opportunity to try a few things. No, I didn't. Uh, or, Sorry. <laughs> Never used it for anything more than keeping the office going. 90% um, of the work that any architect does is work that you have to do to keep the office going. There's not an idea one in 90% of the work that we do. Um, well, I have to say, <laughs> are there never situations where the um, the the client demands are such that you basically yeah. have no elasticity? That's right. No. And so you try a few things no. to get to use elsewhere. Can I tell you what? No, that's not. No, 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 no. Most projects that one is faced with, first of all, how many architects have a new idea every ten years? Very few, right? So. Uh, if you have an idea in your life, uh, I've had one idea, okay? Right. And I've, I've evolved that one idea. Yeah, yeah, but I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm asking you about, is, like the Bloom House is not as interesting as, it, uh, bec basically because the opportunities to do things in it were low. But the things he did in it were really about building a repertoire of episodes that he planned to use later. I mean, I don't really, I don't think you hold the Bloom House accountable to the same. Well, no, no, but the repertoire of, 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 of episodes to me are not very poignant. Let's put it that way. That's because they're essentially not abstract. I don't know why you say it. I don't because know what. They, they, because the problem of the figurality of that cartoon and the, the question I'm interested of in forms of attention. I'm interested in partial you're, figurality. You're interested in near figures. It's yeah, a completely possible, different thing. Partial figures. Right. It's a very different issue. I understand. It seems to me that, no, Greg has said that the object, the, 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 the part, look, my critique of Greg is that what is still in place is the metaphysical project of part to whole relationships. And he says, for him, the part is the whole. That he states it right out. So that is another way of looking at the metaphysical project. If one is critiquing the metaphysical project, which is what my project has always been, uh, then you have to look at part to whole relationships and say they're not very interesting. Whether Greg Lynn's doing them, or Will Alsop's doing them, or Ben Van Berkel, or all the people that you love. Uh, I don't think that that is an interesting issue these days, and that's what, unfortunately, parametric processes began with a critique of the metaphysical part to whole project and became a series of part to whole relationship of another sort. I disagree with you on the problem. Uh, basically, mo many theorists of modernity have basically seen modernity as a privilege of the part over the whole, or reversing right. part to yeah, whole. Yeah, right. Um, but still, or a privilege of the uh, 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 articulating the, the individual to the collective is, yeah. for example, a, a modern idea right. about reversing part to whole relationships. Yeah, but there's still the part to whole relationship. The problem with the still. parametric project is it restores the traditional part to whole oh, relationship. Right. Uh, ab initio. There's no, uh, there's no possibility of breaking right. it once okay. you start the project. Any other questions? Well, that, was a good, that was a good question, by the way. Yeah. So He's a smart kid. Uh, well, I would argue, in, in essence, uh, the questioning of the uh, sign-signified relationship. I started in my PhD thesis in 1962 and 63, and in various ways, which is a critique of the metaphysical project. Uh, my project has basically been a, an evolution to a post-structuralist view of the world. And uh, absent any 
other knowledge, um, I probably am stuck, you know, uh, in that. And if you say, what was my one idea? It came from uh, the need to kill the father, that is, to get out from under Colin Rowe, uh, which is, you know, he was such a strong influence uh, that, um, you know, as a lot of people, as Jim Sterling had that problem, as uh, Aldo Rossi did with Manfredo Tafuri. I mean, there are strong characters, as Peter Cook did with Rainer Banham. I mean, uh, there are strong critics, let's say. The three strong critics of the last half of the 20th century were Banham, Tafuri, and Rowe. Doesn't matter what one says about any of the other guys. I love Ken Frampton. He's not in the same category of Idler, uh, et cetera. But those three guys defined the 50s to the year 2000, let's say. And uh, all architects operating in that, in that dimension were one way or another trying to get out from under that project. And that's what I'm saying. The, the idea I had is, Christ, I got to get out from under row. Uh, I think, I mean, I, I think, I think a, a, a less autobiographical way to answer the question is con contained in your aphorism that architecture is not about structure, it's about the sign of structure. Right. And once you say that, and then you, you can replace that with anything. Architecture is not about the program, it's about the sign of the program. Or architecture is not about function, it's, or not about context. Architecture is not about solving problems, it's creating problems. Yeah, so, but it's also, once you do that, then you detach, or you produce a post-humanist architecture. Right. You know? And I think that was, you know, and then the way you did that is to explore the, an autonomy, a semiotic right. autonomy. Uh, I well, think, the, the, and you know, so the issue here is not a return to a humanism. No. It's the, how to keep the project that project going. No, no, until there's a new paradigm. There's, there isn't. My problem is it was operating within a paradigm. I, I mean, I just, you know, I'm not. Uh, I'm never convinced about paradigm shift arguments. But they, they exist. I don't think so. <laughs> the people do talk about them. People talk about them all. In my lifetime, I mean, I've Michelle heard. Foucault I've talks heard about them. in my lifetime yeah. five epistemic change, changes. Okay, but Michel yeah. Foucault. And does when you read talk Foucault, yeah. an epistemic change occurs about every three to four hundred years. So That's I, right. you know, for people to say, "Oh, it's a new paradigm." No, different. Uh, Remember the savings and loan no, crisis? Minute, that was a new paradigm. Wait a, wait a minute. Epistem change and paradigm change. Paradigm shifts occur within epistemic shifts. Good. Then Foucault never talks about a paradigm shift. No, he doesn't. He talks, talks about, about epistemic. That's shift. Right. right. So, I, I think you're basically the world evolves more than it revolves. That evolution is a better model than revolution, because I don't think revolutions ever actually produce a change in paradigm. Uh, they and so in retrospect, it's very easy to identify something that looks like one, but comets don't hit the earth very often. Here, here's the thing: you have to take the historical moment that. People like myself and, and Michael Graves and John Haydick, Richard Meyer, Aldo Rossi, Jim, were raised in immediately after Corbu, Mies, Wright, et cetera. Now, those guys had a clean slate because there weren't anybody in 50 years in front of them who were like that. The last great guys were Boulay, Ledoux, et cetera, which were 70, 80 years before. So what I'm saying is we were trapped under a, a condition that you had to recognize and operate under. You really did. And uh, I would argue that the people that followed us, I mean, the generation that follow us were trapped in, a, in a, even a worse way because they, they not only had those guys. They had they two had, layers. They had two layers, yeah. right? And so you could argue that these people sitting in front of us um, who will be 60 or 70 years removed from the, the big monsters, right, and don't even know who Colin Rowe and, and Manfredo Tafuri are, are going to be liberated in a way which the people who were operating in the 10 canonical buildings book could not have operated. In other words, there is an existential condition which allows uh, Kevin to ask the kind of question he asked which he couldn't have asked 50 years, or wouldn't have been able to ask 50 years ago. And I think they're in a great situation. Uh, uh, whether there is a paradigm shift or an epistemic shift or not, we don't know. But I think economists today, political scientists, political theorists, 
watching the issue. In other words, how do you deal with Afghanistan, right? In other words, they're, they're, the problem of Afghanistan is the cusp problem of today. You know, if you leave, uh, it's, it's a bad. disaster, and if you stay, it's a disaster. It's a disaster, right? Mm -hmm. Now, how the hell do you get out of leaving or staying, right? Uh, you can't ignore it, uh, and you can't do anything about it. And once capital finds itself in that situation, the, ca the Chinese are laughing all the way to the bank. Uh, in other words, I believe. I mean, they, and of course, we have to realize one market you miss, the big market is India, right? I think. I mean, it's not the Philippines and... and I know, and, but they're, they're not bailing us out. They're gonna. Be careful. See, I think India is, is the real sleeping giant for me because uh, they, <laughs> they, are, they are future markets, baby. Uh, you know, well, I mean, you know, millions of pounds. But I mean, but you know, when you talk about the difference, that what changed between Ledoux and Corbin Meese yeah. was economy and technology. That's correct. You know? and, and and something and like what that. What you're saying and that think, economy and technology. I now, think no politics and economy have changed. There's no question that late capital is not a sustaining issue in 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 a broad sector. Do you think people like Afghanistan give a damn about that? No. No, but I think people care about Afghanistan because they're trying to protect the status of late capital. That's right. They are. What I'm saying is they can't do it. They don't know how to do it. So somebody has got to figure out an economic, not these guys, but there are people out there thinking about that. I mean, look, what brought us to an economic crisis were, I believe, all those people at Harvard Business School figured out a way to beat the system, right? To make money on air, right? Uh, no. What, do you read, what's the guy? What's the what's the essay is for the Post? Really famous sort of commentator for the Post, smart writer, not Calvin Trilly, but what's his? You know, like a for the New York Post, or I think, or you know, who is it? Paul Krugman, you mean? No, 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 light writer, uh, like Breslin, like Jim. Maybe it was Jim. You know, but no. but anyway, he made this really interesting argument that what really happened was management of major corporations were stupid people. And then all of a sudden, smart people right. figured out if they what to actually Use do this. with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, and that's that, absolutely and, true. And, and then that and what. Ha but and they brought the system to its knees. Right. They showed how that much right people yeah. you you could screw the system up royally, right? Not based on work value, any value yeah. at all. Just value. Just so we yeah. need people. No one should be allowed to have a job in management that ever made more than a C. I think that was his argument. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> probably true. You have to make C's to run the world. Yeah, well, I, I've always... I'm Can't run the world with D's, I only hire. We just I only went through hire, that. I only hire B students. <laughs> you know, A students are a pain in the ass. Any other questions? <laughs> they got to be. You got to have another bright guy out there, or gal. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, there's a saying I like, and it's, uh, you know, if you're one step ahead of the Let, let me give you a, a, a football analogy, because I, I Use really, the mic, please. I, I really, uh, I, I think I know football fairly well. This wildcat formation, right? <laughs> what, what is the wildcat formation? It's basically the old single wing, honestly. It is taking somebody that can run and pass and setting up blocking and, and power side uh, runs uh, and blocking schemes, uh, which are different than trap blocking and counter blocking that occur in the T formation, and, and are bringing back something that was a T formation. Now, let's take the Big Ten. The Big Ten is a essentially, uh, because of the weather conditions, because of the kinds of people that uh, are attracted to go to Ohio State and Michigan and Wisconsin, Minnesota. They're cold weather folks. Uh, you know, they throw, I mean, uh, I saw South Florida get demolished last night uh, because they ain't cold weather folks, right? And they, they don't dance like cold weather folks and they don't look like you guys either. Uh, and, and the Big Ten is essentially what it is and it'll never be any different. 
So it cannot take a formation that is essentially uh, something from Miami and Florida and, and et cetera and import it. Now, Rich Rodriguez at uh, Michigan thought he could do that, right? Rich Rodriguez is probably, if he loses again to Ohio State, uh, which he will, uh, is probably gone, right? They've never had a worse record at Michigan because certain things are, right? And they don't change because there are differences. And that's the same thing with architecture. Certain things are and they don't change.